Have you ever had that morning where nothing, nothing was going to wake you up, not work or kids, and you're just going to sleep and sleep and sleep some more? Generally, we find ways to wake up the alarm clock, the spouse, the coffee, but it's not always the case. And in Western Europe during the 18th century, this could lead to some pretty precarious situations. In fact, it's exactly what happened to a castle porter in Vienna, Austria in 1791. He fell to sleep and couldn't be awakened. So people just assumed he was dead and he was placed in his coffin and plans were made to take him to the cemetery. And then he suddenly awoke and he sat up and he looked around and he said, mother, where's the coffee? Although it can be said that this young man just fell into a deep sleep and there were plenty of other reasons that someone else could fall unconscious in Western Europe during the 18th century. For example, in 1738, an unnamed woman in Bath, England, slipped into a river while she was fetching water. She fell in head first and remained underwater for an undetermined amount of time. Eventually, someone noticed she was there and pulled her out. Upon bringing her to shore, she was assumed to be dead. Nonetheless, she was carried to a nearby house and lay down in front of a fire. She was given a water enema and chest compressions were done to try to push the water out of her. After this method was employed for probably about 45 minutes, she regained consciousness. Another such story was that of a monk who lived in London during the 1740s. After he appeared to have died, he was then buried for about four days. And then someone remembered he had a sleep disorder. So they rushed back and they dug him back up and he was actually alive when he came out of the grave, but it was reported that he died immediately after. In 1844, Edgar Allan Poe wrote that to be buried while alive is beyond question the most terrific of these extremes which has ever fallen to the lot of mere mortality. That it has frequently, very frequently, so fallen will scarcely be de denied by those who think. The boundaries which divide life from death are at best shadowy and vague. Who shall say where the one ends and where the other begins? And the answer is medical practitioners, particularly physicians, scholars, and philosophers from past eras. During the 18th century, physicians, surgeons, anatomists, and anatomists worked to identify a clinical definition of death. The proof that blood was pumped by the heart and circulated around the body had been proven by William Harvey during the preceding century. Medical practitioners and philosophers, such as the French naturalist and philosopher René Descartes, the Italian physician Giovanni Lanchisi, and the African philosopher Anton Amo, had worked through the 17th and into the early 18th centuries to identify the location of the soul within the body what its purpose was, and how it helped the body to function. Historically, the overarching goal of the advancement of medical theory has been to keep people alive. Physicians, surgeons, anatomists, and philosophers of prior eras had mo mostly focused on how the body worked and how it was influenced by the world around it. Medical practitioners during the 18th century used this information to try to explain what precisely happened when the body began to die and when it had died enough so that it could not be revived. In 1732, the Scottish surgeon William Tossick was asked to revive a man named James Blair. Blair was a miner who had fallen unconscious after inhaling the noxious steam in the mines. When Tossick observed the body, he noticed that Blair's skin coloring was healthy, but his body temperature was cold. He also couldn't find a pulse or determine if he was breathing. By holding Blair's nose closed and blowing, and blowing strongly into his mouth, Tossick was able to make the chest rise, after which a pulse was detected. At that point, he opened a vein in Blair's arm to encourage the blood to work its way around the body. After about four hours of alternating rubbing Blair's extremities and temples and waving smelling salts under his nose, Blair was able to walk home. Tossick called this new method of revival the resuscitative process mm -hmm. when he published about it in a Scottish medical journal in 1744. The following year, in 1745, the well-respected British Quaker physician, 
John Father Gill enthusiastically published his support of the resuscitative process, declaring that it was the first time that an artificial inflation of the lungs was applied to the happy purpose of rescuing human life from such eminent danger. The following year, the physician Jean Benet Winslow published the book, The Uncertainty of the Signs of Death and the Dangers of Precipitant Interment, which focused on the history of premature burial. In it, he relayed the plight of physicians from ancient Greece and ancient Rome who implored their future medical scholars to use all possible methods of recalling the dead to life and continue to look for new methods to do so. By the 18th century, the medical community's understanding of human anatomy and physiology had evolved to a point where, with the help of the resuscitative process, they could provide aid to the ancient scholar's request. During the same decade, it was reported that the historian of Surrey, England, the Reverend Owen Manning, caught smallpox, and he was reduced to the, by the disorder to a state of insensibility and apparent death. The body was laid out and preparations were made for the funeral. When his father went to the chamber to take one last look at him, he raised Manning's body from its recumbent position, at which time Manning revived. During the 18th century, there were several common diagnostic techniques that a medical professional or an aware citizen would have at their disposal in order to test for death. Basic tests for death attempted to elicit a response based on sensory or automatic body functions. Respiration was tested by putting a mirror or a piece of glass up in front of the person's nose or mouth to see if it fogged. The olfactory sense was tested by holding a pungent scented item under the person's nose. Early circulatory tests, including blistering or burning the skin in order to stimulate the blood to see if the person would react to the pain. If a person responded to any of these tests, they were considered to be alive and they were treated as though they'd recover. Recovery treatment included bed rest, keeping the patient warm and stimulating their arms and legs to aid in blood flow and muscle movement. However, if the patient did not respond to the stimulation test, they were assumed to have transitioned to a state of absolute death, at which point the burial process would begin. It's easy to wonder if any of these tests were actually used. The same tests were reported across Western Europe, which indicates that they were used and used extensively. Plausibly, this was because they yielded accurate results. More definitively, in 1799, a team from Mediterranean University studied 200 skeletons that were removed from a plague grave in Marseille from the outbreak of 1722. Two of the skeletons had bronze pins embedded in the bone at the top of the big toe. Based on the placement of the pins, the team hypothesized that the pin had been introduced under the big toenail. And that's the second picture on my slide here. So the presence of these pins helps give validity to the idea that the rest of the tests for death were also practiced. After a person was diagnosed as absolutely dead, it was time for the wake and funerary process to begin. Due to the time that it took to find a location to dig the grave and to dig the grave, people were typically buried three to five days after they had died. It was believed that during the time between the, the in that time between death and burial, the person was regarded as both alive and dead, and that they possessed a combination of sentience and spiritual power. This spiritual power took on other names during this time period, including the latent principle or the spark of life, all of which referred to the soul's power over the body and its ability to help the person revive. Once a person was declared to be absolutely dead, the body was cleaned and made presentable so that the friends and family could come and pay their last respects. Parties and gatherings were held so that those who knew the deceased could look upon them and make sure they weren't moving or breathing. The party was called the wake, you know, in case they woke up. As time continued on, the customs changed from a gathering of watching the body to the body being placed in an open coffin and the coffin being kept out of the way in the little used room. One person was supposed to sit with the body, but oftentimes the body would be left alone thereby completely defeating the purpose of the wake. So let's recap. 
People were being incorrectly diagnosed as dead. People were waking up at their funeral. People were waking up in the grave. And some people knew how to use the resuscitative process, but it wasn't widely known yet. And then the medical community evolved. In 1773, Dr. Alexander Johnson introduced the concept of the Society for Recovery of, a, of Persons Apparently Dead to England. Johnson had seen the positive effects of the society in Amsterdam, where he had been working at The Hague. The society was responsible for using, advancing, and disseminating information about Tossic's resuscitative process. Using the fact that the medical community in England was already familiar with the resuscitative process, he postulated that without its use, people had been committed to the grave in whom the principles of life may have already been revived. The society was later named the Royal Humane Society and is still in existence today. Even as the Royal Humane Society advanced the study of resuscitation in England, along with additional institutions in France, Germany, Italy, and America, people continued to be misdiagnosed as dead. The 1799 annual proceedings of the Royal Humane Society stated that every man whether prince or peasant, may be exposed to the danger of being buried alive. It was asserted that approximately 21% that all deaths were misdiagnosed and the person was prematurely buried. So I know I have just landed a lot of medical knowledge on you. Does anybody have any questions before we proceed? You know, you mentioned uh, the water enema as treatment for drowning. Are you aware of any other sort of unorthodox methods of resuscitation they might have used? Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, they also use tobacco enemas to try to fumigate the body. Um, they used, let's see, the idea of rolling somebody over a barrel. They would put people over a barrel to try to squish the water out of them. Usually all this did was break ribs. Um, let's see, they would hang people upside down to try to get the water to pour out of them. Didn't work, didn't work. Um, those are the ones that I see most often. Do you, do you have any in mind, Jim? Uh, no, you hit all the highlights actually. Thank you very much. So as the social awareness of people returning from the grave grew, so did the publication of books on the existence of vampires. Vampires have been published about in Western Europe for hundreds of years, and it became fashionable to do so again during the 18th century. In 1741, the Oxford English Dictionary defined a vampire as one who rose from the dead to suck the blood out of living humans and return to the dead. During the mid 18th century, Pope Benedict XIV did his own research on the lore of bodies corruptible and incorruptible and declared that vampires were fictions of human fantasies. Despite his assessment, information about vampires continued to be published throughout Western Europe. A French monk named Augustin Calmet published his book, The Phantom World, The History and Philosophy of Spirits and Vampires or Ghosts of Hungary, Moravia, etc. in 1751, and it was translated into English a century later. And if anybody wants to read it, it's available for free on Google Books. This treatise was the culmination of over 50 years of research and is considered to be one of the most in-depth, interrogative, and widely read vampire treatises of the era. Over half of the book focused on vampires, causes, stories, ways to kill them, as proven in Eastern Europe. He discussed cases where bodies had been buried for over a year, but still showed signs of life, such as the blood remaining in a liquid state, a lack of decomposition, and muscles remaining soft and pliable. Kalman also noticed that corpses of people who had died from disease or poisoning looked similar to those who had been accused of vampirism. He identified that their blood bubbled and rarefied rather than congealing uh, in their veins as expected. One of the vampire stories that he relayed was from around 1730. A German soldier was lodged at the home of a Hungarian peasant and was surprised when a stranger came in and sat down at the table that he was sharing with his host. He noticed the host also seemed quite surprised by the visitor. 
When the host died the following day, the soldier asked for details about the man who'd come to dinner. He was informed that the stranger was the host's father, who had died and been buried for 10 years. And that after dinner, he told the host that, you know, he was going to die. It was believed that the no longer dead father had caused the death of the son. When the soldier went back to his military regiment, he told the story to everybody. Nobody quite believed him. So an inquiry was initiated. The inquiry re revealed that the soldier's retelling of the story was accurate. And upon learning this, the grave of the host's father was opened and it was reported that the body had not decomposed and that the blood still ran through his veins. In response, the head was removed from the body before the body was reburied. Suspended animation and the reanimated corpse began to gain traction as fictitious literary tropes during the end of the 18th century and continued through the 19th century. Snow White, for example, was written in 1812. After Snow White had taken a bite from this poison apple, it got lodged in her throat, causing her to fall unconscious. The dwarves couldn't bring themselves to bury her because she still looked like she was alive with her pale skin and red lips and a lack of decomposition. Similarly, in 1840, in Germany, a 19-year-old girl died of acute pleural pneumonia. The weather at the time was hot, and eight days later, she still hadn't decomposed. Like the dwarves, her parents couldn't bring themselves to bury her, which was a good decision, because on the ninth day, she woke up. Vampire literature of the Romantic and Victorian eras capitalized on fears of premature burial. Trademarks of early vampire literature included the vampire waking up and releasing themselves from their graves and negatively impacting the living before returning to their coffins. John Polidori was Lord Byron's personal physician, and through this connection, Polidori was introduced to Mary Shelley, me Godwin. That summer was especially rainy. This, I'm sorry, it's the summer of uh, 1816. was especially rainy. And Polidori, Byron, and Shelley shared ghost stories to pass the time. During one of these gatherings, Byron suggested that the three of them should try their own hand at writing ghost stories. This resulted in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein in 1818 and John Polidori's The Vampire and Lord Byron's The Fragment of a Novel, both published in 1819. Both Frankenstein and The Vampire including, included drops of medical history. For example, although Frankenstein is more of a cautionary tale about the responsibility of medical ethics, it still included a bit about vampirism. Shelley included this line as Victor recalled the death of his younger brother. I considered the being whom I had cast upon ma mankind and endowed with the will and power to effect purposes of horror, such as the deed which he has now done, nearly in the light of my own vampire, my own spirit set loose from the grave and forced to destroy all that was dear to me. Polidori's The Vampire was obviously set more, more in, in vain of a vampire story. It introduced the well-dressed aristocratic vampire to the genre. A story of seduction among the living dead, Polidori's vampire was a well-dressed man who enchanted and seduced aristocratic women before sucking the blood out of them. In it, his main character, Aubrey, is warned by a female friend that there were vampires living among them, and she even gave him a list of those she knew who had died after being fed upon. Soon after, she succumbs to the will of the vampire, and upon, her viewing, uh, upon viewing her lifeless corpse, Aubrey observes that she has no color in her cheek, not even in her lip, and that there was a stillness about her face that seemed almost as attaching as the life that once dwelt there. Upon her neck and breast was blood, and upon her throat were the marks of, of the teeth that had opened the vein. By the time Bram Stoker's Dracula was written, there had been several advancements in medical theory and technology, as well as tests for death. When the stethoscope was invented in 1816, medical professionals mm -hmm. believed that it could be used to test for death without cutting the skin. But after hundreds of false diagnoses, it became clear that the stethoscope alone could not be used to test for death. Towards the end of the 19th century, hypodermic injections made from a weak uh, solution of fluorescein 
were being used as an infallible test for distinguishing between persons actually or apparently dead. The person was alive, the skin around the injection point would turn red, and the rest of the body would turn yellow as the jaundice, and the eyes would turn bright green. This solution was considered so miraculous that it quickly became widely used and was recognized by the Academy of Sciences in France twice. The juxtaposition of the 18th and 19th century medical theory becomes clear as the story of Dracula unfolds. Unlike most vampires, it was alluded that Count Dracula had taught himself how to turn into a vampire by studying so much that his brain survived against physical death, meaning that his heart and lungs may have stopped working, but his brain continued uh, in a conscious state, which then allowed the body to go on living as well. The 18th century signs for death are also explained when Jonathan Harker locates Dracula in his vault. Harker mentions that the mentions the difficulty that he had in telling if the count was alive or dead because there were conflicting signs of life and death. For example, Dracula's open eyes didn't hold the glassy hue of death, but his cheeks and lips were red. Then again, Harker couldn't detect any signs of breath or pulse. Of course, much of the book of Dracula regards the femme fatale vampire, Lucy. After being looked over by Dr. John Seward and Professor Von Helsing, it was determined that Lucy's illness was caused by a great loss of blood. Here, it becomes imperative that Lucy have a blood transfusion, the first of which had successfully been used between human patients in 1818. Despite the transfusion, she died. Or more specifically, her body entered into a state of suspended animation. At her funeral, it was noticed that she looked beautiful, even in death. And later, when her coffin was reopened, it was discovered that she was no longer in it. Although there were concerns that she had been prematurely buried, or resurrectionists had come and stolen her body, the next night when the coffin was reopened, Lucy was within it, and she had blood on her lips. In Lucy's case, it wasn't until the stake was driven through her heart that her body was finally able to rest in peace. The creation of of the vampire in popular culture has been derived from centuries of vampire lore and medical theory culminated into and then within vampire fiction. The literary vampire has taken many forms, from the femme fatale to the supernatural being to the alluring aristocrat. No matter what the origin story, they all had a strong sense of survival, and they all stalked their play to draw out life force, often in the form of blood. Even as time went on, the core characteristics of vampire stories have remained strongly rooted in the history of medicine. Although I'm not sure that's true in the case of some of the more uh, recent vampire stories, such as Twilight, for which I cannot, you know, I, I can't, I can't make that connection. But anything up until then, I, I'll assert that is true. And this is actually a drawing by Henry Wigstead from the late 1800s, and it shows that one person, you know, aside in a room with with the coffin and the person within it waking up and scaring the heck out of her. And so I want to thank you all for coming to my talk. All right. So we do have a question in the chat. Uh, So are you familiar with the practice of dead sailors being stitched in the canvas bags and saving the last stitch as a needle through the nose? And can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's actually how I got into this. (laughs) Literally, literally, I was watching Master and Commander for like the 17,000th time. And I, I heard that and I went, oh, that would be really awful if that was true. Let me see if it was. And now here we are. So um, it was, that is something that was actually done. And it was done as a way, as a precaution to see if the person bled. Uh, and there are actually some stories that come from the early 18th century, yeah, no, early 19th century, late 18th century about sailors being stitched up in their hammock and the last one through the nose and the person either like, you know, jolting 
from the pain or there being a drop of blood and that actually causing people to stop and delay and see if the person woke up before they were tossed overboard and certain to drown. Uh, so how much of the fear of being buried pre-death uh, and awakening after you've been buried, how much did that permeate 18th century and 19th century life? A lot, a lot. In fact, people were more afraid of what happened the, like the act of dying than they were what happened afterwards. So in co some cases they had religion to soothe them and to make them feel better of what was going to happen to them after they had died. But because so much was unknown about how the body died, what happened in the body as it died and when it could be revived, there were some people that like, like the, the one slide had, uh, had joked, you're, you're going to have to kill me before I die. There are actually stories about people uh, writing in their wills that when they die to wait seven days, 11 days, 15 days before burying them. There are some that leave money to the surgeon to slit their throat before they're buried to ensure that they go into the grave alive. So that was something that people were really really afraid of they they you know they were more afraid of not dying than they were and being considered to be dead than they were of actually dying and what would happen to their soul after um can you talk a little bit about maybe some of the precautions that they would have taken to avoid being buried alive aside from you know leaving money to people to say kill me for sure um in the 18th century the, some people would leave kind of guards outside of, especially if they could afford it, outside of a tomb or a mausoleum um, to open it up in case they, they were knocking. Some people would hire guards to stand outside their grave. Uh, in one case, this was to keep people from stealing the body. And in other cases, it was to make sure that if they were knocking and yelling, people would dig for them. In the late 18th century in the 1790s and then through the uh, 19th century people actually created a big old it almost looks like a, a fire bell creations where they would it's called safety coffin and they would tie a rope or a, like a metal almost like a metal rope around the dead person's hand or wrist or foot so that if they were within the grave uh, and they started freaking out and moving the tremor would travel up the rope and the bell would clang to let people know that they were alive down there. Others had, uh, that they were like tunnels where you could see the face. So if you'll, if you look, if you do a Google search and you look up uh, Victorian coffins, you'll see them with glass panels around the face. That was to ensure that people were decomposing or not. And um, some people, again, if they could afford it, would actually create this tunnel over the face part up through the dirt. And then they would have a, almost like a viewing screen up top where you could then look down and see if the person decomposed or not. And I believe there's one of those up in Vermont. Uh, we had someone remark in the chat that there's an example of the bell in Bonaventure Cemetery in Savannah. Nice. No, yes, I've seen that. There's also, um, I don't, I don't remember if it was that cemetery. There's another one uh, in Savannah that has uh, sniffing posts. They're actually metal tubes that came out from the grave to make sure that the person decayed. And uh, so the guards would walk around and kind of sniff for decay or not decay. And to some credit, you probably hear somebody yelling from there. Um, there's also a safety coffin bell in um Vienna, Austria, and Central Cemetery within inside their museum. All right. So circling back to the vampirism. Well, wait, Stan's got a question here. Yes, Nicole, real interesting. My question is, um, I'm studying about Paul and I'm gonna do a uh, thing about one of his books. Um, could you tell us why was Paul so concerned with being buried alive with premature burial? Well, you know, it's 1844. Certainly, you know, he was writing from um, from America, but it was it was happening there, too. I just happened to study England. Um, so, of course, Poe is the master of horror. 
And this is real horror. This is stuff that's really happening. You know, when he says the the worst of his extremes, um, you know, he's showing that even from what comes out of his head, this is even worse. And it's really happening. And it's something people have been living through for a long time. So I think that even for him, it's something that scared him. Okay, so uh, if we could circle back to the vampirism angle of your talk. Uh, mm -hmm. So what role did things like porphyria play in establishing some of the myths around vampires? Well, that has to do with symptoms. So if you have, you know, until I get really until the late 19th century, early 20th century, most of medicine was symptom based. So people look at your symptoms and then try to figure out what to do for them. So if you if you think about somebody who has been prematurely buried, they are lethargic, their their pallor is off, their their eyes are bloodshot, there's probably, you know, and, and purple and you know, purple around them because you've got the, you know, they've got um oxygen deprivation. And really you start seeing similar um you get similar symptoms. So if there's similar symptoms, there's misconceptions about maybe they're being linked. And, you know, there are, there are scholars who believe that those medical issues are why we have vampires. I think that they are a symptom of a larger issue. Uh, so sticking with the vampire end of the lecture, uh, you mentioned that when they would dig bodies up, it would be suspect if they hadn't decomposed. So what oh, yeah. kind of things, you know, what could cause the body not to decompose for a long period? Uh, well, if there was too tight of a seal on the uh, the coffin, especially in the in the 19th century or within a mausoleum, if you're, um, you know, if you're burying somebody basically within a giant cement box. Uh, not a lot of air is going in or out. So they're not going to, they're going to decompose at a much slower rate. There are also things like um, the, the hair or the skin on the scalp or around the fingernails will draw back and it'll make it seem like their hair is getting longer or their nails are getting longer, making it look like they're continuing to live and that they're not decomposing when in fact, this is a reason for it. Uh, there are other uh, you know, signs of vampirism that show that their bellies were engorged. And it was assumed that the bellies were engorged on blood when in actuality it was happening because of the gases releasing from the decomposition of the organs. So it wasn't necessarily that the body was whole and they looked exactly the same way as they went in, but more so that they were showing signs of life, You know that people thought, well, this is what a living person does, and that person in there must be living because they're showing all of these normal automatic functions of the body. Um, and they're just misunderstanding what was really going on. Do you have any recent statistics of people still kind of waking up in the morgue, uh, having been prematurely diagnosed as dead? It's a great question. I don't have any from, from that are modern. I, I really like my, my research really does a hard stop at 1850. Um, but I do know it happens. I have done these talks for a long time. I have been told by many medical practitioners that, hey, that happened in my morgue. Um, when I started working in the healthcare system, I've been working in healthcare for 20 years. People came up to me and said, did you know that happened 30 years ago here? <laughs> no, thank you for terrifying me. I won't come here. <laughs> so I, like, I know... <laughs> I know that it still does happen. It shows up in the news from time to time that, you know, somebody came, I think it happened, I think it was in Georgia in the early 2000s that, you know, somebody revived during their own funeral, um, which, you know, with embalming, I'm not sure how that happened, but uh, okay, you know what, at least they're alive. <laughs> so I know it does still occur. Um but no, I, I don't actually have a, a modern statistic on it. When was rigor mortis recognized as being just a, a defining the fact that someone was dead? 1860s to 1880s. It took a really long time for people to figure that out. Uh, let's say if someone wanted to know a little bit more about this topic, 
where would they go? Which part? <laughs> so if you want to learn more about um, the misdiagnosis of death during the 18th century, I would absolutely recommend, let me make sure I'm telling you the, the right name. It's Death Dissection and the Death Destitute by Ruth Richardson. Um, it was actually the first book that I ever received on the topic. So that, that's the one that sent me down my rabbit hole. Um, if you want to know more about this entire topic in its entirety, am I allowed to say this, uh, Jim? I asked. Okay. Um, you can um, go, you, you can buy uh, how, you know, When the Dead Rose in Britain, Premature Burial and the Misdiagnosis of Death in Enlightenment England. Uh, and that's actually my book. And then let's see, if you want to know more about vampires, probably Vampire Forensics is a really good one. Sorry, I know I'm turned around. Oh, and The Work of the Dead by Thomas LaCour. Um, and those will give you a really good understanding. Uh, Thomas LaCour will give you a good understanding of the death in, you know, the, the study of death in a large, long timeline. Um, Richardson is more of premature burial and the misdiagnosis of death. Mine, this could be actually kind of a summary for the book. And um, yeah, so that, that's where I would say to go for more information on that. All right, excellent. I can personally vouch for a uh, death dissection of the destitute. I've used that one several times for presentations. And so it looks like we don't have any more questions in the chat. So we'll go ahead and bring it to a close for today. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you very much to Ms. Nicole Salamone for joining us and helping us discover more about our world. So next week, please join us on Wednesday at noon for How a Terrorist Failure in 1605 Enabled Jamestown and Henrico. Uh, you've heard people referred to as a gentleman and a scholar. In this case, it is literally true for our speaker next week. Uh, we have Mr. Tony Pelling. He's retired undersecretary for the UK Department of the Environment. Uh, definitely, you will not want to miss out on this one. If you are all interested in uh, Guy Fox and the history of the gunpowder plot to try to blow up parliaments, uh, you will definitely want to check out next week's talk. You can register for that talk at smv.org. Each talk is free to attend and is open to the first 300 registrants. Thank you again for joining us today. Until next week, stay safe and stay curious. Thank you all for being here.